Welcome to this typewriter broke. This episode is pretty complicated. It's about as complicated as rushing water down a stream like this. We've got lots of different threads. But the basis of it is the Underwood 5 that William Carlos Williams used. Today I have a friend's Underwood 4 standard from 1907. And that is the era that William Carlos Williams was writing poetry. His first collection, I think, came out in 1909. And what's so interesting about this connection, you know, every author has some instrument that they use, but with the start of more contemporary poetry, where words landed on the page was really quite important. And how do you do that? longhand. There's actually a paper that was written in 1988, Machine Technology and Technique in the Poetry of Marianne Moore and William Carlos Williams. You know, the, the typewriter really changed poetry, and William Carlos Williams changed his own poetry. <laughs> This is a very Baroque typewriter. It's an Underwood 4. It belongs to a friend of mine who collected typewriters when she was in high school. So she had a few left. This is one of them. I worked on it earlier, got it working, but I did not clean it up very much. As you can see, it's got a lot of grime, and we might get down to taking care of some of that in this video, but um, mostly the action here is very slow. Sometimes they stick, the type bars stick, and she thought maybe a um, some kids got a hold of it. She runs a Airbnb, and uh, she thought these used to work, and now they don't. It also might be that I cleaned out the segment and uh, did not actually clean some of the linkages underneath, and they might be closing up. Did give it new feet. Those are very pretty. So there's that. And then there's also this is not really I mean right now I don't have the uh, spring connected because I'm planning to take all this off. Um Things, the carriage runs along these bars, and if there's any corrosion, it can hang up 
and there's also one in front here that can be sticky. So you have to take the carriage off. And um, like I said in my previous video, these are pretty much indestructible and they're really easy to take apart. So uh, we'll go through some of that. So this is this is one part. Once this is off, it'll be a little easier to see in here how that needs to be cleaned out. And we're outside because it's lacquer thinner and paint thinners that are not good to have inside. So this is a good day to be out doing work. So while you watch me take apart the underwood, um, I'm going to get back to poetry and this article about the typewriter in poetry. The article quotes Charles Olson saying, It is the advantage of the typewriter that due to its rigidity and its space precisions, it can, for a poet, indicate exactly the breath, the pauses, the suspensions even of syllables, and juxtapositions even of parts of phrases, which they intend. Olson saw a typewriter as enabling the poet's voice to be quite exactly registered in his verse. In the 1910s and again in the 50s, Williams used the typewriter in essentially the way Olson describes, to indicate phrasing and pauses precisely. His comments to Edith Heal about his technique in the late teens points to just such a use. He says, the rhythmic unit decided the form of my poetry. When I came to the end of a rhythmic unit, not necessarily a sentence, I ended the line. The rhythmic unit usually came to me in a lyric outburst. I wanted it to look that way on the page. Oh, and now the carriage is going to be coming off here. Whoop, there we go. So it's just four screws. And then off it comes. Now it's left to connect the beginning music, a 78 from 1926 down on the banks of the Yazoo, it's a river. But nothing like the river I videoed in my neighborhood. The Yazoo is a tributary to the Mississippi down by the Delta. So that would be a very flat, slow moving river. But that song was pretty bouncy and pretty upbeat and kind of like a waterfall. But the reality is there's a tension between these things. And in William Carlos Williams' poetry, there's always a tension between what he's trying to say, what he's hoping to say, and what he's able to say. So this offering of a poem entitled A Marriage Ritual. Above the darkness of river upon winter's icy sky dreams the silhouette of the city. This is my own, a flower of fruit, an animal by itself. It does not recognize me and never will. Still, it is my own and my heart goes out to it dumbly, but eloquently in my own breast, for you whom I love and cannot express what my love is, how it varies, so I waste it. It is a river flowing through refuse, the dried sticks of weeds, and the falling shell ice lilac from above as if with thoughts of you. This is my face, and its moods, my moods, a rippled whiteness shaken by the flow, 
that's constant in its swiftness as a pool, a Pollock in stinging wind, her arms wrapped to her breast, come shambling near. To look at what? Downstream. It is an old world flavor. The poor, the unthrifty, passionately biased by what errors of conviction. Now a boy is rolling a stout metal drum up from below the riverbank. The women and the boy, two thievish figures, struggle with the object in this light. And still, there is one leafless tree just at the water's edge, and my face constant to you. Well, now the typewriter gets tipped on its edge because this helps when you're freeing type bars up that they don't have the help of gravity. This requires them to be really freewheeling. I saw this on some video on YouTube, maybe Phoenix typewriter. But anyway, it helps to ensure that you're really freeing up the keys and the type bars are going to operate precisely. And after all of this fussing around and putting lacquer thinner in the segment and all of the linkages below, you end up getting keys that uh, are very responsive. Well, we have it all opened up, you know, and the keys are now working instead of being sluggish, unless you hit two at a time. You can see the uh, ribbon mechanism here because it feeds down, and then there's this mechanism that works like that and then if I pull the the thing back and forth it switches over to turning the other one and this can all gum up pretty pretty thoroughly this looks like it's working pretty okay for now. Won't worry about it. But you do have to make sure that the tops, when you are on that, doing that turn. Because if they aren't turning, your ribbon's not going to move, which is going to hose up your rib. This holds this bar on. And you have to turn this tab so it'll feed through there. Otherwise it hits and you can't get it off. You can feed it through and voila. Now we can work on it without any problems. I'm far from an expert on William Carlos Williams. I've been reading his poems for some time, but I haven't until recently made a real study of him. But it seems he aligned himself with what was called the Imagist. H.D. is one of my favorite poets uh, who was an Imagist. Basically observing something and translating that into poetry you know, in its fullness. Um, 
And then he went to Europe and was exposed to Cubist painting. And the Cubists, you might think, have sort of funny looking paintings, but it's taking several perspectives on an object and expressing them all in one flat painting. So things can be distorted or out of order in a way. But if you imagine looking at it from several different perspectives and then putting that all into one painting, that's kind of where William Carlos Williams took his poetry. I'm reading now from a book called The Hieroglyphics of a New Speech, Cubism, Stieglitz, and Early Poetry of William Carlos Williams. And it says, William's dominant characteristics were so curiously literal-minded, which made him capable of seeing poetry almost entirely in terms of painting, and his tendency to adapt the ideas and creations of others to his own use. Ultimately, his great merit and his role as an original and influential poet depend on his extraordinary single-minded tenacity in attempting to turn poetry into a form of painting. For by trying to do so, he pointed out a possible method for the use, which can be made in poetry, of fragmentation, immediacy, condensation of imagery, and simple, precise diction. In this vein, William Carlos Williams did a series of poems about Bruegel paintings, uh, one of them, Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. I include this because it's one of my favorites. According to Bruegel, when Icarus fell, it was spring. A farmer was plowing his field. The whole pageantry of the year was awake, tingling, near the edge of the sea, concerned with itself, sweating in the sun that melted the wing's wax. Unsignificantly off the coast, there was a splash quite unnoticed. This was Icarus drowning. Inch by inch, applying paste wax, to that piece of 115-year-old typewriter. And this is the only material that won't take off the paint and the, it might be, decals on there. And it's delicate work when you're going over something that's colored and encrusted with 115 years of grime. But this wax actually serves as a very, very gentle solvent and will take off the grime and leave the paint, as you can see. So after the cleaning, we have much better. So as promised at the beginning, this typewriter broke and the Underwood Ford never did come back to life, even though I loosened all of the joints and got everything cleaned up. The escapement was indeed broken by probably some kids.
but you never know. Could have been a rough adult. I had managed to swing the escape mitt in the back and wiggled it, and I thought it was working, but when I got it all back together again, alas, alack, it was not. <laughs>